All right. We're back again with the impact of educational leadership, part six. I'm your host, Isaiah Jordan III, along with Professor Jeff Willie. All right. Our panelists tonight are Jan Watson and Lynette Dubon. Uh, first, we have Professor Jeff Willie. Professor Jeff Willie is an executive director with John Maxwell team, specializing in personal growth and leadership development. Professor Willie is an educational consultant, conflict resolution trainer, mediator with over 30 years in conflict mediation, and a former facilitator of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Expected People. Professor Jeff Willie currently travels, uh, presenting high-level church, school leadership, and personal growth workshops throughout the United States and throughout parts of West Africa. Professor Jeff is married to his high school sweetheart, Pat, for over 42 years. They have two lovely daughters, Dr. Katrina Willie Musoma, she's a pediatrician, and uh, Ursula Willie, she's an attorney, and one grandson, Nathan. Next we have on our roster is the incomparable Jan Watson of Better Dowsit, Inc., Jen Watson, with over two decades of global business development and job placement experience, ranging from corridors of Capitol Hill to the front lines of the healthcare industry, Jen is recognized as being on the cutting edge of science to position people in their strengths with an impressive track record in domestic and international sales, marketing, public speaking, and training. In 2009, Jen left the top ranks of an international pharmaceutical uh, company as leader and started her own consulting and coaching firm, training individuals and groups to uh, their job fit. And while surveying and analyzing scientific results of individual behaviors, tracing their influence on team dynamics and employee turnover, Jan found that true diversity extends beyond the external and physical to the there are differences where we cannot see, and this is why she trademarked her program, Behavior Diversity. As Jen desires to help others create dynamic change, she grew into her own life's purpose. She transitioned her company into the nonprofit organization Better Job Fit, Inc. as a celebrated advocate for those experiencing transition. She is committed to social justice and counsels the veteran and foster care population, maintaining strong alliances with nonprofit agencies such as the River Jordan Legacy and the American Veterans Alliance Vet Power LLC and the Institute for uh, Restorative Communities, Inc. to create internships and permanent placements for those populations who are too often neglected or overlooked in their struggles to start over. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Introducing Jan Watson, uh, Lynette LeBaum, and Professor Jeff Willie. Guys, please say hello to the people. Hello. Great to be here. here. Welcome aboard. It is, it is fantastic to be here, to be alive, to hang out with such phenomenal people on this line. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. It's an honor. All right, all right, all right. Well, let's, let's go into this here. Uh, tonight we have a very delightful topic uh, we will be talking about and discussing in depthly the career effectiveness in educational leadership. I say again, career effectiveness in educational leadership. And so there is seemingly a need for more models of ecological consultation to promote diversity and inclusion in higher education. Such applications uh, must be practical of ecological consultation aligned with systems, system theories that can assist an organization in system change. Mentoring is a complex endeavor propelled mainly by love and care. Let me say that again. Mentoring is a complex endeavor propelled mainly by love and care. Even researchers, researchers' examinations of mentoring practice in many cases explore the behaviors, the relationships, leadership styles, personalities, individual gifts, and learning styles which create the cornerstone 
of the formation of mentoring. Now, mentoring begins and ends with exploring and validating each individual's gifts. And those gifts are the gifts of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, whereby mentors provide presence, encouragement, and accountability for life's journey. Professor Jeff Willie, what are some ways that the impact of educational leadership can positively, positively affect and promote how you select your mentors and of how they can help you career-wise? All right. Let's do this thing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Isaiah Drone, and it's such a pleasure to be on the phone line with uh, Jan Watson and Annette Lubon, and I appreciate you asking that question and your introduction and to start this conversation off was absolutely very, very meaningful because you, you mentioned a key word, and the key word was love and care. You have to love people. To be a mentor, to be a coach, you have to be in love with people. We are all put on this earth to have a purpose, and one of those main purposes is, is to take care of people. Love thyself and you will love others and learn to love people, key component. And my tagline is serving and adding value to people. People are my business. And I have to always practice this, uh, Jan and Lynette, that uh, Isaiah will probably have to stop me because I can get carried away and I have to watch myself. So just be prepared. Hold on to your seatbelt. I try to be as uh, patient and try to be as succinct as I possibly can to answer the question. And also to keep it very, very simple, the essence of relationship it's simple. It is really simple. You have to love people. As a mentor, you have to challenge your person. You have to be accountable. You have to be trustworthy. You've got to have a level of a confidentiality, and you have to be a good listener. And one of the things about being a good mentor and a good mentee as a coach or a coach, I am a coach, but guess what? One thing about being a good coach you have to be coachable. You have to have be. You have to have a coach yourself. A coach without a coach is not coachable. And so, no matter what you go through, you need to be coachable. You need to be always teachable, and you upfront with that with a person that has selected you to be your be their mentor. And that is the other aspect of that. They must select you. You're not out looking for mentees. There are folks in your organization uh, that you might desire, desire to ment, uh, mentor, um, but they have to really select you, and you have to earn the right to be a person's mentor, and you have to earn the right to be a, a person's coach. Well, let me give you some, some characteristics that I see in a phenomenal list, uh, in a phenomenal coach or a phenomenal mentor, and this comes under word leadership. If you want to put leadership on a piece of paper and do it vertically, you start with the word, the letter L. You have to be a phenomenal listener. You have to be a listener with your heart. That's the focus of listening because you have to get a good understanding of what a person is saying. And it's, that's one of the most challenging things you have as a mentor. Uh, we want to be able to tell. And a mentor is not a telling, it's a coaching. Coaches don't tell. Coach asks. Coach, that's what coaches do. So you have to listen to what's being said. And the E is being empathetic. That understanding of what's being said, you might not agree or disagree, but you have to be empathetic, not sympathizing, but empathizing with the person. Put yourself in that person's shoes, and you connect with that person. And be aware of what's going on around that person by asking particular questions. There's a great book that I use quite often to help uh, with coaching clients and also with leaders. And it's by, of course, obviously John Maxwell's book. It's called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. The power of being a good coach and a good mentor is being able to ask questions. And you have to empower. You have to empower. Of course, D, I skipped D. With key, it's key is about being decisive. Decisive means is that uh, once you are coaching that person, you got to teach that person to be decisive once they're aware of everything. And you have to empower that person. And I'm going to get into some other characteristics in a minute because I want to talk about this last word that I'm going to give you at the end, even though it's in the middle. Uh, but you have to be real. 
a mentor and a coach has to be authentic, has to be real, has to be transparent. You have deficiencies, you have weaknesses, you have challenges and things that you have overcame, that I have overcame, and be connected with a person, I let, let them know that I have had some challenges in my life as well. A mentor is not perfect. A coach is not perfect. That's why a coach always needs a coach. And as a good mentor, a good coach, you've got to be a servant person. You have to be in servanthood because in leadership, we get this incorrect. Serve, then lead. That's the focus of being a good coach. You serve that person. You are there to serve them. And the H part of that is being humble. And now we say humility is a key component of being a good leader, but sometimes we all struggle with that. And be honest about that, being, having a humble attitude. That's something that we have to practice on. Maybe, maybe uh, Isaiah and Jan or Annette may not have to practice on that, but Jeff will have to practice on being humble every, every day. And because it is something that I have challenges that challenges me is being humble and let your mentee. Hey, I, I'm struggling with being humble too. So let's work through this together. And more importantly, of course, is being honest and this level of integrity. Be and be honest with your mentee. Be honest with the person that you're coaching, and then preserving. Teach your person that P is teach your. You have to practice preserving yourself. Be a role model in what you do in your lifestyle. Let your walk be your talk. If you are asking a person, and sometimes I coach persons through the fitness aspect of their life, how to better become a, uh, exercise, how to eat better, how to live better, how to, get, uh, how to overcome stress, and how to manage yourself and make sure exercise is part of your daily routine, at least part of your lifestyle. That has to be part of your lifestyle. So you teach them through how to preserve themselves and take care of themselves. And this is what you do when you mentor someone. This is what you want to get them to do. And I mention this because I want a mentee to be real because I want to be real. And that real is an acronym, R-E-A-L, is an acronym. And that first part of that R-E-A-L stands for relationship. You want to teach the mentee, and our focus is the coach and mentee, to be honest about their relationship, to be to add value to themselves through character education so they can add value to others and they can reach their full potential. And you want that to be so, with them. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, that, Brother Jones. That is so powerful. Let me park the car right there real quick. Okay. Let me recap on something. Let me recap on something. I want to make sure the listeners heard that. You said purpose is the main purpose is taking care of people. And then you said yes. the essence of, now watch this. You said the essence of relationship is simple. And, you know, Professor Jeff Willie, you have such a simplistic way of breaking down complex themes and complex discussions. It, this is a gift. I mean, and then you went back and you said a coach must be coached. My goodness, and then you went and, and you briefly, and I appreciate you for doing that because I know you could have went in depth with leadership and the different characteristics and uh, what each letter meant. And I was like, I, I want to bring Jan in because mentors, the key, and this is just me from my research, I think mentors are equivalent to scaffold. What I mean by scaffold, scaffold are those structures that you use to make buildings with. They're those, they're those metal pieces that you climb up and then you build, you put brick you know, together using these scaffoldings to kind of hold everything together. And, but these scaffoldings, as it relates to mentors, are the people that give people the knowledge to connect, right, to connect to new knowledge, right, and, and to reaffirm knowledge that's already been learned and to help these people transition right, from one maybe job career to the next and to show how they can fit or what's their niche or what's their why. Professor Willie always says that. I want to know what is your why. And so, Jen, Jen Watson, are you there? I am. I want to ask you a question. Yes, sir. How, how can individual behavior traits and their influence on team dynamics be improved by mentorship and coaching practices? You know, that, that is definitely a, a very 
insightful question in and of itself. Because, you know, Professor Willie made a comment about knowledge, right? And with behavior diversity, what I found for the past probably 12 to 15 years, deference versus difference. Deference, the definition of deference means respect. And as Professor Willie said, that empower or knowledge, empowerment comes with knowledge. And when we talk about focusing on respecting our differences, so to speak, or behavior diversity, what my experience, and, and I want Lynette to, to share her experience as well, you got to know yourself first. What's interesting, if you know yourself, where you fall on a scale, say like on a behavior scale of assertiveness, if you know you're an eight on assertiveness, on the scale of extreme, right, from one to 10, and you're dealing with somebody that possibly could be a three, two or three on assertiveness, you have to be mindful of how another person could perceive you. But if you know and you're doing your best to know about you and in relation and in respect to how you fit in a team of others or with a group, it allows you then to understand how to navigate yourself in, in the pool, so to speak. So what we found was, especially when we talk about mentoring or it, like attracts like. We, but at the same time, if you have a company and they're hiring for, so to speak, culture fit, they're hiring like, every, like everybody in the company. So you can have a lot of external diversity, but when it comes to behavior diversity, you can have a lot of people that are very similar. So you have a, not, not a lot of different ideas. So it actually squashes innovation. You know, that mentorship, and as Professor Willie shared, you got to love people, but, but that empowerment comes with knowledge of the self. And if I may ask, um, Isaiah, if I can ask uh, Lynette to share her experience when we, when we spoke, when originally when we met at the University of Phoenix alumni uh, career portfolio series a couple of months ago. Lynette, would you please be so kind as to share what you asked me about and, and what the situation was at your office? Absolutely. Thank you, Jan, so much for inviting me to speak on my experience. Uh, initially, the question I asked Jan was basically involving communication style and the diversity within my experience with a leader who I felt did not engage in communication with employees. And what I found after speaking with Jan and taking some of her advice and acting upon that advice, that you have to be able to make the necessary adjustments to meet the person where they are. And once you can stretch to make those adjustments, that can improve the dynamic of the working relationship. So I would say that behavior diversity does require to make necessary adjustments to effectively collaborate throughout the organization. And you know, Lynette, what I remember you shared that it was like a shift. Once once you could speak or understand where you probably were from a, a style of communication and you were able to address from his perspective, did you say that it felt like it just totally shifted your relationship with the individual? I, I agree with that, Jan. Yes, it did. And I think it absolutely bridged the gap in the communication so that we were able to engage with each other more frequently and more effectively. And, you know, the, when we talk about the 
that knowledge. Again, empowerment. To feel empowered, you have to be exposed to knowledge. You have to know yourself and know where you fit in with the group and team dynamics. Um, and again, that love of people, but also really caring enough about the knowledge of yourself and how you can play a, an important role in impacting team dynamics, team relationships, individual relationships. Um, you know, you spoke about mentors, and I think of my, the people that have been my mentors throughout my life, they were leaders in their own right. They were either deans of universities or directors of, of companies. Um, they were all good communicators. And I love what Professor Willie said about listening. And when he read off the acronym and, and what that meant, each, each letter meant, that exactly explained and described every m mentor that I have had in my life. And I'm so blessed. Um, you do need to earn the right to be a mentor because it is one of the greatest callings that I believe it one could have. It absolutely have. is. And, and right. you know, that brings me to my next point, Jen, because that, that you, you are on it. <laughs> I like how you talked about, let me recap, I like how you talk about assertiveness. When I first met you, that was the first word that I had in mind. <laughs> she is so assertive. But then I, then I like how you, 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 you captured us when you start talking about being mindful and the mindfulness and the perspective of being mindful and the lens that you have to sometimes change depending on your audience or your environment. And I tell people this all the time. It's not that you are two-faced. It's that you are navigating. And so you talked about how you fit in a, a group by navigating yourself in these pools of, I'll say, these colleagues. And then what a great expression by bringing in Lynette to talk about her experiences and how she had to navigate through uh, the correct tools that I'm sure you enlighten her with to, uh, you know, kind of navigate through these different communicative styles and to engage more with her employees and, and, and employers using it. And, pro, and I'm sure it probably gave her a promotion. And so what I got from that is some key elements or attributes that we have to have to be effective mentors. I got you need gravity. What I mean by gravity, you need seriousness. You got to be real. You got to be serious. But you also got to know when to be silent, know when to be quiet which leads us to being humble, you know, and then you got to know how to be prudent. You have to have a level of prudence. And all this is tied to wisdom, all right? But it means nothing without patience. you got to have patience, right? And the real true seasoned masterminds, the master leaders, have gentleness because gentleness is a strength, okay? And, and then you can have that zeal and this balance, and then you can have that – uh, that generosity and is not you're not overdoing it. My next question is for Professor Jeff Lee, but Jen, that was that was so 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 enlightening. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and you too, Lynette. I appreciate you as well, Professor Jeff Willie. Uh, what are some techniques, especially after what we just heard? What are some techniques to help employees manage? their emotions in hostile workplace environments. Well, before I go there, you know I'm going to follow up. Now, you knew I was going to follow up with what Jan and Lynette said. Now, you, uh, you should have just went ahead and asked me that, Isaiah, before I can go any further into this next question because what they said was absolutely enlightening to Lynette. I appreciate you being transparent and, and sharing that information. And, Jan, thank you so much for that 
that that was very, very enlightening, all about relationships and about being gentle and self-controlled and love and have a heart for people. I'm just paraphrasing as much as I possibly can, but it was just absolutely amazing. So I appreciate that. And then what I'm going to follow up with you, you asking about his and her emotions. Now, let me just help you understand about emotions. Um, A person has to make a decision to control his or her emotions. The environment is the environment. And I'm going to get to that word hostile environment in a minute, but I want to make sure we understand that, that that has got to be a, a person's got to have a desire and a willingness to be able to control his or her emotions in spite of the current situations, because you make a choice. You make a choice to decide, to react a certain way based on the environment, uh, based on the circumstances. Uh, sometimes you can't control the circumstances, but you can control the response to those circumstances. That's what you have control over. And hoping that that people, as they mature in emotional intelligence, they become more aware of this is some of my triggers. These are some of the things that trigger my emotions and I'm self-aware. As Jan put it, you must know yourself to grow yourself. So grab hold of that. You must know yourself to grow yourself. And once that self-awareness is there, and that's on a daily basis, get more in touch with yourself and reality. What are my triggers? And then, and to follow up with that with the hostile work environment, I always put it in this perspective, in this paradigm, in in this box. What's contributing to a hostile work environment? What is causing that? And I can say say this, and and that's many different, some come with many different reasons, but it comes for a lack of culture, a lack of proactive culture, a lack of caring for each other, a lack of servant leadership, of lack in having a leader with vision and focus, because leadership is about relationship. It is not about the product. Leadership is all about people, nothing else. It's about the people. That's what the leadership is. Management is about a product and about a resource, but leadership is about the people in general. Now, let me give you some things that I want to help with that. And because hostile working environment is basically what you're saying, we have a conflict going on. There's a, there's a, there's a lack of proactive professional communication. There's people that are not being cared for effectively. My values and are not being appreciated. I am not being empowered. I am not allowed to take risks, and, and I'm, I'm being chastised when I make a mistake. I'm making the mistake is an indicator that you're doing something, so that should be empowerment, should be encouraged when a person is making a mistake. A, mis- a, a mistake is an opportunity for grow, growth, and so I must have a culture when folks are making mistakes are taking risk as we say i like to, i like to use the analogy of taking risk versus making mistakes and i got to have a culture that allow my men and women that work under my leadership uh, under my under my influence because leadership is strictly primarily influence nothing more nothing less i got to have an environment that i encourage risk taking i want to tell all my young men i want to tell go make mistakes and let's talk about sometimes you win Sometimes you learn. What did you learn from that? Not a loss, but a learn. But some things that I, uh, I want to bring out in regards to that to kind of help some folks bridge some of those gaps is that I want to give them some things about what is contributing to that. And then if, if controlling those emotions, uh, sometimes you've got to allow, as a, as a leader and as a manager and as a mentor, you've got to allow for those strong feelings to come out. Why? Because you want to listen. Sometimes those strong feelings are very valid of a need that needs to be expressed. It could be something that's been pent up for a significant period of time, and you need to allow that to come out. You need to have an avenue and an environment for that to come out, whether it be in a closed session where you can listen, listen objectively to that particular person, vent their frustrations based on, because there's some there's 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 valid information that comes out of that. And if you listen to what's being said, listen from the heart and not take it personally, because it is not personal. If you, if you have taken it personally, and then, and then there's a reflection of what's going on inside of me as a leader, as a manager, I put it this way. People are not leaving organizations. You're not. People are leaving people. They're leaving their leaders. 
because their leaders have not cared for them, their leaders have not appreciated them, their leaders have not respected them, their leaders not have valued them as contributing members of the organization, contributing members of the team, respected their opinion and highlighted their opinion and appreciated them, and that creates what I call what you are referring to as a hostile working environment. It's not really hostile, it is not relational. Wise. That's hot. That's, that's, that's hot. That's hot. Absolutely. That is mm-hmm. hot. I, that is I Kali, gotta tell you, Kali, I love that. I, yes. I and I was about to ask that. you, what it's do you think? Talk hot. to us. Oh, I love that. Come on. Come on. Come I, on. I, I love that. that. I, Dr. Willis, that is awesome. I just dig that. It's not hostile. It's just not right. relational. Okay. Because, you know, when you use that word hostile, Isaiah, it makes me uncomfortable, okay? Yeah. Because now you're set, words have vibration. And when you start bringing that up, now, now that already adds fuel to the fire when you're using the word, yeah, mm-hmm. right? So let's just call it as it is. It's not relational. Hostile is a, is a, re, is a reaction. Action. Relational can be fixed and repaired. Hostile reminds me that somebody pulled a gun. Right? That's good. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's, that's, it's such a strong word. When you say it's not, when it's just not relational, now it's, it seems like it's fixable. Yes. Like, wow, it's not as, not as, it's not that it's bad, you're not using that judgment word, but it makes you want to, just try hard, like, oh, well, okay, what do we got to do to find a solution? Oh, my gosh, Dr. Willie, I love that word. Thank you for sharing that. Well, oh, well, it's a Dr. lovely Jan, word. I have, I have, uh, when I see it, you have the same reaction to the word hostile that automatically yeah. stirs up things differently in me. So that's why I shifted that very quickly. And try to and and try to get that in a very soft. as who we are. We are people. We're relational. Yeah. And that's who we are. That's the focus. Oh my that. gosh! So I love I, that word. Thank you, Isaiah, for asking the questions. And you and you know me. I I always bring the what I call the simplicity because God has gifted me to take very very difficult topics and make them very simple for people can digest and apply them quickly. You know, I feel like I'm on a softball uh, field, <laughs> and and you guys are just throwing stuff all over the place. I'm trying to kick. I'm trying. I'm running all over the place, sweating all over the place, uh, <laughs> diving in, sliding into to the base. Jan, let me ask you a question because you just really motivate me. Okay, and so I want to know what is it that drives you? Okay, who are your mentors, and how do how do they help you? You know, when Professor Willie said about you got to be coachable, right? Coaches have coaches. Because if you're, not, if you're not continuing to have a coach or mentor yourself, that means you've stopped learning or expanding or growing. And the number one, you got to be coachable. So I continue, you know, I have a life coach of my own. I have, um, I'll be very honest, I am very blessed. My husband is a mentor of mine. He was started out, we were introduced uh, in a business setting, and I, have, I always respected him, and, and from, you know, he had several businesses, and so I love learning from him about business and about different circumstances. He's a, a king negotiator but negotiating from the place of respect and of others, right? I mean, it, it, there's negotiating that can, can be brutal, right? There's no win, you know, there's only a one, one-sided win. I, I love the fact that I've been, my mentors have shown me it's about creating win-win situation. So I, I just love the fact 
that my mentors in the past and current continue to remind me of how I should be, a reminder of what grace is, what, um, what, what that responsibility is, because it is. It's, it's an honor, but it's also a responsibility. And thank you for asking, Isaiah. Can I just oh, add, please. may I add something? Please, uh, one, please. I, I like what, she, I like what uh, Jan just uh, alluded to about being the win-win. Uh, when you are negotiating, uh, mediating, you're looking for a win-win, and when you're dealing with collaboration, that's what, that's what you're doing. Uh, you're trying to get that one plus one equal to three versus one plus one equal to two because two is still that mean as individual and three is an odd is an anomaly and that's an odd number that mean i have brought the best of jan's idea and the best of jeff's idea and we come up with a third alternative so we both have a win-win and we empowered to ex ex execute uh, it's not all of my idea, not all of Jen's out there. We take a combination of that, and we come up with one plus one equal to three. It, isn't that option. called the Trinity? Isn't that called yes, it is. the Trinity? Yes, it is. <laughs> isn't it a wonderful thing? <laughs> well, it's awesome. It's awesome. Well, Professor Jeff Willie, let me ask you that same question. Who are your mentors, and how do they... Help you. Let me uh, give you some insight of uh, my my mentors, and, uh, and I have to say it started. That was a long road for me because of the way I grew up, not uh, being uh, subjected to a a level of not trusting folks uh, early in my life, especially in my uh, um, first part of my military career. Um, but I did start surrounding myself with folks that were doing things that I wanted to do because I always had this vision of there's always something that God has asked me to do. So I, when I saw people that I admired on based on what they was doing and I start asking them, what are you doing? Uh, how can you help me reach this level? And so but let me give you one person that really impacted me very early, and this goes back. And I am trying to find this person. I'm going to find this person. This person is probably in their 70s right now or maybe even their late 70s. I may have been early 80s, I'm not sure, but it goes back to my 10th grade. And that's a long, long time ago for those. I'm not going to date myself and tell you how young I am, but it goes back to when I was in the 10th grade, and that, that was a, a, my track coach, now Reggie Day. And, and he saw something in me that spawned a sense of desire and push and drive that keeps me still fueled today about you can if you think you can. And, and, and I am going to find that person because um, prior to that, I've been subjected to a lot of uh, negatives, a lot of bullying, uh, lots of folks that uh, wanted to uh, run me down and beat me up, so I became a fast runner so they couldn't catch me. And so that, that kind of spawned my track years of being a phenomenal track person in high school, and Coach Reggie Day was the one that said, Hey, Jeff Willie, you can do this. I believe in you. And he spun that energy in me. So when I first came in, got into the military back in the late 70s, that still was a lack of trust factor. But I still remember that voice to get around people that are doing things better than you. And I say this, and then, of course, I have a, I have a business coach right now as well. And then I have to say this. And, Jan, I like what you said about your husband. I've been married to my wife for over 42 years. And to this day, my wife is still my mentor. Oh, I up. love that. Thank you. Thank you. That makes me feel good. I mean, I'm, I, I appreciate having the, the venue to be uh, authentic like that. So thank you for mm. saying that. I appreciate yes. that. Yes, ma'am. She is still. She is. I still go to her after, because I say I married up. And I know why I married up, because God put me in the right place. I always say this to people. If you're the smartest person in the room, you in the wrong room. In the wrong room. Yep, I hear it all the time. Let me ask you. Let me ask you both this question. And Lynette, you can chime in as well. I want to know this question. What? How do you feel inside when you meet the right mentor? What feeling do you have? Well, well I can say. Sure, I can say that Jan is a mentor of mine. I met Jan and. 
The feeling I had inside immediately is just like a marriage, you know. You know, and I knew from just meeting even her presence before she even spoke a word, her spirit. And her spirit just poured into my spirit. And I just know, and I value her so much. She oh, just thank you, Lynette. In the room, in the room, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jan. I, I, um, I, I just think of, you just, like you said, Lynette, it's a click. There's, there's a connection that's beyond a, thir- a three-dimensional understanding. It's, it's, um, it's, it's like it was destined for, you know, that, again, two people coming together, it was destined, were destined to touch one another's life. Yeah. You know, to leave a footprint, to leave a... Um, to cross paths, to share wisdom, to share, you know, to come together and to be part of one another's life for however long it is. It's that giving and receiving from both ends, you know, we sometimes get, we sometimes forget or don't really think about it. Mentor and mentee, there's a giving and receiving on both ends. The mentor receives just as much as the mentee. I mean, if you're not feeling growth, if both people aren't feeling growth, then there's something missing. It's a sense of, of uh, feeling like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. We're, spo- we're supposed to be servanthood. You know, we're supposed to serve one another. That's, that's what we're here for. So being a mentor and a mentee, you know, we cross one another's path in life to be of service to one another. And I just, um, just really, I think as it's becoming more and more valued, and it doesn't matter, and Professor Willie, you can attest to this as well, it doesn't matter what the age of people are, we are expanding our awareness as human beings and we are understanding the value of relationship and value of life experiences. Um, I just really appreciate having an opportunity to understand that, appreciate that, and to collaborate and to be in presence with you three with relationship, with collaboration, with crossing one another's path. I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, yes. And absolutely, you, you, um, you both have stated it so eloquently in regards to, you know that when there's a connection, and, and uh, I, can I use my uh, family situation, my brother, my second brother, is, is we are a family of 12, and he is number, he is number five in the family. And uh, we're 10 years apart. He's um, 10 years older than I am. And so I grew up idolizing my big brother. And, uh, but I did not know he grew up late on in life. He grew up idolizing me. And we just clicked. And uh, we're 10 years apart. So we really didn't have a whole lot of connection as youth. Um, but as we became adults, uh, we, we established that what I call growth mindset, willing to learn from one another. And, and I appreciate him even more because he's willing to learn from me and I'm willing to learn from, from him. And that has really bonded our love even closer as siblings, even though we grew up in different generations and different times. And as Jan stated, it doesn't matter the age. I can learn from a 15-year-old. I'm willing to, if I have a coachable mindset and willing to open my mind and listen to what the that 15-year-old can teach me a lot. It can probably save me a lot of trouble and help me learn to communicate with a 15-year-old because I need to be able to communicate with a 15-year-old as well as I need to communicate with an 85-year-old. I need to understand those communication styles. And I end with this and say this, Isaiah, I thank you so much for doing so and allowing us to be able to be on this in this platform to be able to share uh, the things that's valued to me and hopefully that I'm sharing and is valued to others as well and 
folks are willing, folks are willing to apply what we're saying because I'm willing to apply what I say. I want to be able to walk my talk. So, Isaiah, I still take my hats off to you, and Isaiah is a connection. I see him as a mentee, as a mentor. We have bonded together, and uh, we go our separate ways at different times over the years, and next thing you know, we come back to each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Listen, we're we're out of time. Oh, love you guys. Listen, uh, give me some takeaways from tonight. Uh, so, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Give me one takeaway. Yeah, that's fine. The takeaway that I have is just when it comes to relationships and behavior, we have to be intentional. You know, we have to build an environment or a space that's safe to open up and to be ourselves and to trust one another and to be open to share. You know, and that, that's true, Lynette, that, that accountability of knowing ourselves, especially as Professor Willie, uh, you know, em- emphasized, knowledge is power. First know yourself and then, um, you know, being able to know how you can communicate better with others. Um, you know, at least we can control that. We can only control us, right? And our emotions and how we respond versus react. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, Jan, I'd like, to, I'd like to add on to that. Knowledge is power. How about the application of that knowledge becomes power? And so I would always, always like that. to add on. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that, that, that sometimes we gain knowledge and become, uh, we become a, uh, a, a library of idiots because we have yeah. knowledge in our head. <laughs> That's right. You, 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 know, you know a lot, but you're not doing anything about it. You're not doing anything about it. So uh, that's, that's kind of my the relationship with Matt. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being transparent. And, yes, the key component is be intentional about our relationships. And as I get younger in my years, because I'm growing in my mind, I'm getting more intentional. So thank you. Good evening. All right. Well, you've been listening to the impact of educational leadership. This is part six. I'm your host, Isaiah John III, along with Professor Jeff Willey. Our panelists this evening were Jan Watson and Lynette Lubon. And we thank you for your time. Good night. Good night. Good night.